What is happening, everybody? Welcome to the Somebody Like You podcast, where today's topic we are talking about demystifying and understanding the broad topic of anxiety. Um, as we get started here, I always like to start this with a sponsor, a word from our sponsor, which is the Somebody Like You Mental Health and Emotional Wellness Coaching. And instead of going through the spiel, what we are just going to talk about today is if you are looking for somebody to speak with about anxiety, about setting boundaries and relationships, about mental health and clarity and mental well-being in general, somebody like you, mental health and emotional wellness coaching is there for you. Um, you can jump over to the website, www.somebodylikeyou.org. Or if you follow me on any of my social channels, please feel free to reach out and ask questions. Um, it's not going to be a sales pitch. It's going to be finding ways to help you. If I am not the way to help you, best help you, best serve you, I am going to do my best to find the best avenue for you. So, as that is getting started, we are going to touch on understanding anxiety and how to achieve mental well-being. So let's have a loose definition of anxiety. It's your brain trying to connect with your body and how your body is feeling. And they're on two different wavelengths. Let's look at it that way. Your mind is telling one story and your body is telling a completely different story. Oftentimes when anxiety or panic, if you suffer with panic disorder, anxiety disorder, I, I often kind of interlock them because I suffer from both of them. Or I don't want to say suffer. I live with both of them and I navigate both of them. So they're interlocked with me. So if you have one or the other, experience one or the other more, just kind of in live time, translate that to how it best relates to you. So um, your mind is trying to tell your one story. Your mind's trying to tell one story and your body is on a completely different wavelength. So what happens when especially panic or anxiety is happening, your body is telling you that you're in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn mode, right? It's the adrenaline, the cortisol rising. Um, where your mind is not connecting is your mind is trying to tell you that you're safe. Nothing should be wrong. Um, or it could be the opposite right? Especially with like social anxiety, you're, you get in your mind, you're getting surrounded by a bunch of people and your body feels like it should be okay. But your, your mind is now telling a completely different story. So what we're going to talk about today is how to work through those things, how to better understand what anxiety is and almost unveil the causes to anxiety. Um, I've done Personally, I've gone through somatic experiencing therapy, SE for short, um, and that helped me understand the energy and how the mind and the body is connected. Um, I learned in my personal experience, and this may relate to you as well, um, I'm very mind and head heavy. Um, I, While I am a creative person, I'm a logical problem solver. So when things don't line up, logically, and this is anxiety, right? Just trying to connect dots. Um, I spiral. Um, and for me, it's catastrophic thinking. Um, if I feel like a heartbeat, if I feel, or if I feel like a, a heartbeat skip, if I feel lightheaded, I think that's the end. Right. And I, I had to work through some, I lost traumatically lost some people in my life. Um, so I think that's the trauma where that stems from. And my mind tries to complete that story. It's not my mind or my anxiety's fault. Um, it's doing its job. And that's the thing about anxiety is think of it. It's like your ego, right? Your ego isn't designed to run the show. It's designed to kind of protect you. That's what anxiety is essentially trying to do is protect you. Anxiety's job is to tell you, hey, hold on. Don't don't do that. Some bad things may happen because in the past we've seen some bad things happen in the news or the social medias or whatever. We've seen bad things happen. So we're going to raise a flag here. That's anxiety's job where the line gets blurred a little bit is we sometimes when we're in an anxious state or a state of panic, anxiety or panic are now running the show. Our mind is no longer connected to the body. It's running its own race and the body is doing its own thing. So think of it that way. When your mind and body are out of sync, that's when anxiety and panic essentially ensue um, because you're not grounded. You're not being present. You're either living in the future. That's anxiety. And depression is also from living in the past. So sometimes these can be connected, right? So 
some of these causes can be social, right? Some of these can be the fear of leaving the house, agoraphobia. We've talked about that previously to this um, and how to work through these things. Some things can be upcoming events, traumatic thinking, OCD. Um, some of these causes have various factors that contribute into the development of anxiety. Um, and don't forget, you can be genetically predisposed. Predisposed is a word, right? have a genetic predisposition, um, environmental influences, and life experiences. Right? Your mind is trying to complete a story. That is what the mind is doing from TV shows you've seen, from things that have happened in your, in your past, in your life, things you've heard about. Your mind is trying to, in lifetime, finish that story, predict it, essentially. And then where we come in is we start to believe that that's the only way it can happen. The anxiety and the panic are telling us that's the only possible outcome. Remember, that's one outcome. So it's not lying to you. It's telling you the truth about one possible outcome. But I often, I, I said this the other day, think of fish, right? Being in a sea of water. All they know, 99%, this is a made up statistic. I don't know this actual st statistic. 99% of fish only know water. They don't understand that land space or time or anything actually exist. So think of that as anxiety, right? Your anxiety is only living in that water of one possible thing. Now, a lot of things can happen in that world of fear, uncertainty, anxiety, panic, all of that. But there's other things that can happen and are possible. And if you live in the world of understanding or working to understand energy and frequencies and vibrations and quantum type things. You're going to understand this next point. The more you think about the, ang the anxiety and the anxious thoughts, the more you're attracting those things to happen. And oftentimes the mind knows that. And that's what causes like this spiral of doom, this feeling of, well, I can't stop these thoughts. So I'm now the cause of these things happening. And you see how that starts to spiral. It starts to make it feel like now not only is this happening to you, but you're the one causing it and you can't stop it. It's if you understand anxiety, you understand the spiral that you get caught in this vortex. It's like being on a hamster wheel and you see everything else around you and how beautiful it can be. There can be sunshine, there can be rainbows, but you can't get off the hamster wheel. Let's talk about how to get off the hamster wheel a little bit. First, understand that anxiety is doing its job. It's perfectly natural for your body to feel this. Everybody has anxiety. Different levels of anxiety, yes. So don't feel like I'm sitting here and being like, everyone has it, get over it. No, 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 I say nay, nay. That is exactly the opposite of what I'm trying to convey. Um, while everyone does have anxiety, there's different levels to this stuff, right? Um, some of us, for me, I experienced agoraphobia for about a year and a half. Leaving the house was more than a challenge. It felt like a death sentence. It felt like no matter what I did, I was going to go into, I have eight hour panic attacks. And I mean like violently shaking, chest is bumping, like I've gone to the hospital multiple times. That's nothing new for people with anxiety and panic attacks, right? Going to the hospital. Um, but what I've learned through the agoraphobia and stuff like that is a little thing called exposure therapy. Now, I want to get out ahead of this and say, I always recommend talking with a professional, um, whether that be a therapist, a counselor. I do mental health coaching. I can definitely assist and help through that. Um, but I always am going to suggest working with a professional. I quote that by saying this next thing. I did not do exposure therapy with a professional and I found great success in it. Um, I found that exposing myself to the things that are causing me anxiety is the only way to know that anxiety is just a thought and a feeling connected to that thought. So what does that look like? There's two types of exposure therapy. There's gradual and there's the diving right in, right? 
there's the gradual where like you're going to go do some things that cause you anxiety, but you're going to start very, very small. So I'm going to use walking into the mall as a, if you have social anxiety, walking to the mall can be terrifying. So what you might do one day is simply get in the car. You don't even have to drive to the mall. Just get in the car. You can even start smaller of just getting ready to go to the mall, right? We're going to take these steps and break them down as much as possible. Then the next step would maybe be driving to the mall and just driving back home. Your next step, sitting in the parking lot, hanging out, watching people walk in and out. You see where this is going, the garage, and then eventually you're going to work your way up into maybe getting a couple steps into the mall, getting into the food court, um, getting food from the food court and leaving. Like You see the steps, right? You can hear, you can understand the steps. Um, that is wonderful for some people. Um, that was a little bit of too much of a slow burn for me um, because that felt like for me, I had more anxiety about the thought of having to take it this slow. Like it was more of my ego getting in the way and I understood it was an ego problem. Um, the ego is wonderful. I have a wonderful relationship with my ego now. So I was appreciative that the ego was telling me we can do this a different way. I chose to kind of dive right in and this took a while. This wasn't like, I was, I was like, you know what? I got this. I'm done. I'm going to go do this. Like this, like I said, I was a gore for about a year and a half. It, it took some strength to get to where I was, um, to get to that mindset of like, I'm just going to start doing things that are bringing me this fear. Um, I wouldn't be able to leave my house without my medicine. I started leaving the house without my medicine. I started going to friend's house, even if it was like I said, for like 20 minutes. But I said, now's the time I'm going to go. And it doesn't matter what happens. So we're going to go back to this, the um, example of going to the mall. If you're diving right in feet first, you're driving to the mall and you're having your anxiety, maybe having it. You're, you're almost trying to cause yourself to go from a zero to an eight, nine or a 10. You want to feel the control of you're the one causing this anxiety and this panic. These things, the places you are going, you are willfully going to them. Um, so you then might go walk into a store deep in the mall, we'll call it the record store. And then you're gonna sit in there for 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes might be a long time to be in a record store. Um, but you're gonna have your panic attack. You're gonna have your anxiety attack. And you know what you're gonna do? You're going to get through it because you get through anxiety, you work through the panic. Um, and once you do that, there's something funny that happens in your brain. It starts to understand that you're safe. It starts to believe that this isn't life or death. Uncomfortable, yes, very uncomfortable, but there's all these things happening or all these videos you're seeing as hacks, right? I, I have done the ice pack on the chest. I've done the face in the ice water. Um, but if you're in a pinch, obviously you don't want to be feeling as you're working through this, right? However, what you're teaching your mind in these moments is that you need ice water. You need an ice pack. You need other things to be safe, to get through this. That's not working through your anxiety. That's not that's having a crutch. Um, think of it as a little kid um, who loves his teddy bear, doesn't want to go anywhere without his teddy bear because he feels safe with it. Um, there comes a point where he no longer will be leaving the house with his or her teddy bear. That's kind of what you're looking for with this anxiety. This exposure therapy is trying to teach you that no matter where you're going, the anxiety is not running the show. It's just kind of like a friend, that anxious friend of yours. That's like, hey, we shouldn't go in here. Hey, we shouldn't do this. And at some point, you might identify with them, but you're going to outgrow that. And you're going to be like, hey, I got this. That's what this whole gradual verse jumping in thing. And I want to give you the scientific proof is that they've done studies on this. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but there's really no difference in which method you choose. Um, it's more what you feel comfortable with. So if you're more of a gradual person, you're like the thought of doing that, jumping into this mall or the record store for 10, 15 minutes, I can't do that. 
Awesome. Take a gradual. Remember, self-compassion is part of this anxiety trip. Um, that's totally cool. Be gradual. If you if you have what I like to call my competitive mind, and I sit there and I'm like, you know what? I'm done with you running the show. Um, I'm just going to go do this. I'm going to go prep myself for a big game. You know, I've played in front of big crowds. I've, I've, I've done this stuff, right? I know I have it in me. I know I have the ability to get through this. So I'm just going to turn on the competitive mind, the competitive brain, turn it on. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get after it. I'm going to teach anxiety that I'm in control. I appreciate all it's trying to do for me, but it ain't happening today. Um, and that's a process. That's not going to be a one and done type thing. That's just kind of like, you know, when you are practicing for a sport or practicing a new skill or learning something new, you know, you have to continue to use it and do it. If you, if you don't use it, you lose it kind of thing. Um, so I think that's a great way to understand that anxiety, that there's a light at the end of this tunnel. If you, or if someone you love experiences anxiety, it's not a forever thing. You might live with a version of it for the rest of your life, but you are a, there. I promise you there is this light. And I remember I was reading a book. It's called Untangling Anxiety um, by Joshua Fletcher and Dean Stott. And that explained it perfectly for me. So I highly recommend if you are experiencing anxiety, um, that is a wonderful reference. I'll repeat it one more time in case you missed it. Untangling Anxiety by Joshua Fletcher and Dean Stott. Um, that was a huge game changer for me um, to understand what exposure therapy was, what anxiety is, because they explain it beautifully in the sense of anxiety is simply an unwanted adrenaline rush. Um, and if we want to get scientific here, if you're look, if you're more of a person who's like, no, well, tell me, guy behind that microphone, you are a wonderful talker, but I want to hear some rock hard facts here. Um, cool. So your amygdala, right? It's in your brain. It is the thing that does not receive information. It only gives information. So it doesn't listen to what you're saying to it. It doesn't understand the logic and what you're trying to have. All it does is reacts to what the body is telling it. That's the connection to your mind and your body. That's the limbic system, right? Mind and body connection. Well, the amygdala is not ever lying to you. It's taking in cold, hard facts from what the body is telling it. And it's saying you are in crisis. So what it then does is it raises the cortisol levels, right? Raises your cortisol levels. And what that does is when a certain level of your, when your cortisol gets to a certain level, it releases adrenaline. Like you're jumping into a fight in the octagon. You're getting ready for a big game. You're going into your social. It's telling you these things. So now you're sitting in your office, you're sitting in your room, or you're out in public and you have raised cortisol. And essentially what I tell myself is right now, I'm just having an unwanted adrenaline rush. Now, does that make it fun? Does that make it fine? No, but I understand it. So now here, right now, you can understand what this is, right? This is the demystifying part of anxiety. You can understand that what this is, is your body is thinking it's walking into the gladiator arena and you're sitting at your desk reading an unwanted email from Sarah. Everyone has a Sarah. Um, if your name is Sarah, I apologize. Change the name. Um, so you understand, like, that's where we talked about in the beginning of this is the mind and the body are kind of operating on two different, like the mind the brain, I should say. So understand there's a difference between your mind and your brain. Your brain and your body are telling a completely different story than what your mind is trying to tell. So when you're experienced, when you were a loved one is experiencing this heightened level of adrenaline and cortisol levels, here's the comfort. Your body can only produce and release so much adrenaline at one time. So if you're a stats person, that is going to end and it might not, like, it's not going to just end and then you all of a sudden you're going to feel great. You're going to feel burnout. You're going to feel tired. Your probably body's going to hurt. You're going to feel like you just went through war or you went through a fight, but it's going to end. So sometimes you have to sit there and you have to understand that 
I'm going to wait this out or I'm going to continue on with my day. And I suggest this is kind of like the exposure therapy. This is another wonderful practice is if you were going to do something, don't let anxiety stop you at least do a version of the thing you said you were going to do. So for me, if I'm having an anxiety attack and I like to seclude myself, I like to go into a room. I like to do all the things that, you know, give fuels the anxiety, whether that be eat bad food or what I will do is I, I like to play my music. I like to play my guitar. You can see in the back or my piano. Um, I love to do that. But if I had plans to say, go to the movies or go to dinner or watch a movie in the living room with my fiance, um, I'm letting, I'm honoring the anxiety by letting it know I'm listening to it, but I'm also telling it, I'm still doing the things I said and felt I was going to do. This is just that version of exposure therapy of letting the anxiety and the panic know that it doesn't run the show. Like, it's not the end all be all. It doesn't let you know you dictate what it's going to do. And by doing the things, you reinforce that. You let your mind know that you're present at that moment, that anxiety is present at that moment. But no matter what, you still work through this. I'm still, because up until this point, I mean, raise your hand or type in the chat, or if you're listening after the live broadcast, take a deep breath and understand that. Up to this point, you've probably let anxiety and panic run the show. I understand it. I did it for years. This is that kick in the butt to know you can get through this. It's now a choice. It's now a kind of a looking in the mirror moment. And kind. It's if you have a character arc, this is that moment where you start turning, turning the whole story around. You look in the mirror, the music starts playing. And you say, like, I got this. Anxiety doesn't run my life anymore. If I'm feeling anxious, that's okay. I'm going to continue doing the things I was going to do. Now, I'm, am I going to do it with the enjoyment or the level of enjoyment I thought I was going to? Maybe not. But we only are going to know that the more we work through this. And I have another really powerful um, kind of... I don't want to call it a hack, but practice that I have and I help my clients with is it sounds super cliche, but self-compassion through this. And one way I practice self-compassion um, is understanding that like, I don't want to kick the anxiety out of the room and that's okay. Um, Cause up until this point, we've fought anxiety. We literally put our boxing gloves on and have trying to kick it out punch it out. And we've just fought anxiety for the longest time. And it's one, right? We've maybe tried to find these tips and tricks and hacks and things to make us feel like we have the upper hand. Um, if you're finding tips, tricks, hacks, and all these things, but anxiety still shows up, anxiety is winning. Um, so a really, I would say game changing method. I, or at least I would say I, uh, practice I implement myself is I sit with my anxiety. Imagine your anxiety. And for some reason, so it's where my panic and anxiety really reached its height. It was when I was living in Florida. So I picture it walking through the door of my Florida apartment and coming in and sitting on the couch. And at first I'm like, what are you doing here? Get out. I don't want you here. I'm, I'm doing things. I'm doing things like you can't be here at this time. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm going to the movies. I'm going to hang out with this person. I'm going to hang out with my friend. I got to go to work. Um, at that point, the anxiety is like, I ain't going anywhere. In fact, I'm going to cross my arms. I'm going to stay here all freaking day because you are such a jerk to me. Um, yeah, that's how anxiety will work. So let's try this. Invite it in, pour it a glass of water, have it sit on the couch, sit down with it. And I ask myself this question. What? Hello, anxiety. What are you trying to teach me right now? What lesson are you trying to teach me right now? Because oftentimes it's like a kid just wanting to be heard. It has something to say, but we oftentimes are the ignoring parent saying, we don't have time for you. We don't have time for this. You know what happens to that kid when we just constantly ignore it? It grows up to act out, right? We've seen it over and over again. Some of us may have been that kid that acted out because we didn't get attention. 
I can't say that was my story, but I definitely have understand some people may have been that way. But understand that is anxiety. It's trying to sit on the couch and just talk to you for a second. I, so I will give you my example, real life example yesterday. I went to go pay bills. I went to move money because see the way my banking, my checking and saving account works. It takes three days to, if you're a Kevin Hart fan, you'll get that. Um, but when you go to pay bills and you watch money dwindle from your bank account and you see how much money you've spent on food um, and things you probably didn't need to order and have direct correlation with your mental health. Um, and you start to see the months coming up and you start to see how much money is left in that account. Well, your self-worth starts to feel very correlated to that money that is in your account now, doesn't it? Now, do I know in moments like right now that my self-worth is not dependent on a monetary value? Absolutely. I ask myself these questions, or I should say, I ask anxiety these questions. What are you trying to teach me? And I listen as if I'm in tune with the best version of me that's not feeling anxious at this moment. And it says, it almost asks me questions like, are you helping people? And I'll say, yes. Does that bring you joy, happiness, fulfillment? Check, check, and check. Yes, it does. Wonderful, wonderful. Do you find you are having an impact on other people's lives? I truly do. For the first time in my life, I truly, truly do feel like I'm having a really positive impact on this world and making a positive ripple. Anxiety sits there and almost crosses its leg, getting comfortable now. And it goes, well, now the lesson we're trying to understand here is I've been shaking your mind, shaking your body, panic attack, right? To get your attention so you can understand that number in that account is simply a number. And the anxiety that I'm presenting as is letting you know, yes, that can become a problem in the future. If you don't have money to pay bills, if you don't do this, you but you can work through that. But your self-worth and value is not related to that number. I say, well, it doesn't feel that way. And then anxiety in its sarcastic humor goes, well, didn't we just ask you, are you helping people? And you said, yes. Does that bring you joy? You said, yes. Fulfillment, yes. All of these things. You're making a positive ripple in the world. Does that sound valuable to you? As you've mentioned numerous times that your purpose is to help others. Yes, 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 and yes. Okay. And I'll use myself in the third person here. Okay, Ben, or as my parents look, okay, bud. Um, you're a smart person, right? I like to think so, at least emotionally intelligent. <laughs> um, if we said all of those things and you said, yes, you were feeling you're making a positive ripple, you're having fun, you're making people happy, you're impacting people's lives, you're helping people, all of those things. Doesn't that sound valuable? Yes. So what did we learn here? We learned that we're not directly correlated with that monetary value. That is just something I've been conditioned to believe that if I don't have more money, I'm less valuable. Well, that's not true now, is it? No. Does that take away my anxiety all at once? Absolutely not. But just like the purpose of this podcast episode of understanding anxiety, what it does is it one, it demystifies it. I now understand why I feel the way I do by letting anxiety in, sitting on the couch, pouring in a drink and saying, what are you trying to teach me here, homie? Like, why, like, why do you keep popping up? And it's telling you, telling me, well, you keep kicking me out. And I just want to tell you one freaking thing. Can you just hear me out? Yeah, 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 I got time. Yeah, 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 I can do this. And then all of a sudden, wouldn't you say that that, lesson of I am not monetarily related to my value, like I am so much more than what a number tells me, is a pretty big life lesson. Does that mean I won't feel in the future? No, but I have now addressed the elephant in the room. I'm valuable. Every night before I go to bed, I say I am forever conscious of my true worth and I feel it. This was almost like a moment of, do you? Do you feel it? 
or are you just sitting here saying affirmations because you think they're going to magically appear? Well, I actually feel it because I took time to sit with these emotions that are making me feel the opposite to better understand them, to learn a lesson, and then to continue on working through it. Was I still anxious when I woke up this morning? Yes. Was that a problem? No. Do you want to know why? Because I've created a routine that I stick to. I know I post a lot of things and I say, you know, got to do this. You got to set boundaries. I do those things. I live those things. And if I wasn't to do them or live them and I was just to make content around them, I would be a fraud. <laughs> but I can tell you by having that routine of getting up, moving, getting some movement in. I am currently at 616 calories burned, 43 minutes worked out. Now I've only stood for two hours, but that's because I had a prep for you wonderful people. Um, but that's where I'm starting to understand that the things I create, the things I talk about truly help, right? So whether you're working through just general anxiety disorder, panic, I don't want to say just general, because I have generalized anxiety disorder and that is a struggle, right? It's not just, it's get the generalized word out of there. Um, generalized means, um, everything feels like it gives you anxiety and we can't specifically put that, put a pin on it. So we're just gonna say it's general. And then you have panic disorder, social anxiety, specific phobias. Like we talked about agoraphobia, not wanting to leave the house. Once you start to better understand and map it out, um, if you're watching, I started to write things down on, on a piece of paper to better understand myself and the version of me that is feeling anxious and then the version of me that doesn't feel anxious. Um, and I start playing that role. I'm like, well, what's the non-anxious version of me doing right now? Because I'm going to do those things because you know why? I know that version of me isn't anxious. That's when we talk about like being in alignment with your best self. That's the things we're talking about. And there's so many practices to do that. Um, and I'm actually thinking about um, doing like a month long course um, of helping people through this um, and then having some actionable things we can do together. Um, things that have helped me help clients. And so that's something I'm thinking about doing just because I've seen it work. Um, cause it helps your mind and your body connect, especially if you're in a room with people, right? If you're experiencing anxiety, I was talking to a, a, um, sometimes you have, when I say sometimes, I mean, I, every time I work with a new client, my eyes are open to what anxiety can do to somebody, what panic, trauma, PTSD can do to somebody and how strong you have to be to get through this. And the com the correlation I always find is when they start changing their environment and the things they do, the people they hang out with, the stuff they consume, the anxiety doesn't just magically go away, but you're now surrounded by things that don't invite anxiety into your life. I can ask you right now, what's something, what is the cause of your anxiety? I know as we jumped on um, the live before I, I turned my podcast on, um, someone mentioned like experiencing anxiety of like their child going to kindergarten for the first time. That's understandable. You can't just not send your kid to school. Um, you can explore other options if you want to do homeschooling and stuff like that. But sometimes it's not an option. You know, I'm sure parents have always worked through these type of things before they get to this point. Um, but surround yourself with supportive people, supportive content. You can follow teachers. You can follow a whole bunch of content that's going to make you feel better about this stuff. Just like the news is going to make you feel bad about things and, and implant fear into your every day, you can implant support. You can implant love, kindness, empathy, gratitude, all by the stuff you choose to filter and watch. So that's one wonderful way to work through this. Like I said, I hope I can create that course or create that group uh, to help facilitate that um, because the power starts by breaking the stigma 
and understanding what's going on with everything. Um, like we're talking about demystifying the anxiety, demystifying panic disorder, PTSD. Um, we've all gone through things in our lives that feel so unique to us. But once we understand that other people feel the same way, we're not alone. Now, have they gone through the specific trauma we have gone through? No. But we have to kind of stop wearing that as our badge of honor. It's like when I have a conversation with people or clients and they say, yeah, but I'm the most stubborn person you'll ever meet. I'm so bullheaded. And you see this like puffed chest come out, almost like they're proud of it. And I have to be the person, you know, because my job as a coach is to tell them, is that something you want to be proud of? Because it seems like that is a cause of a lot of these struggles. A lot of your anxiety is trying to bull rush and do things in opposite of the service of being healthy, getting through it. I mean, that's massive. And then you can almost see this face of like, well, yeah, I feel like I kind of knew that. All right, well, it's time to start calling yourself on your shit. What is the thing that you're doing that is not in service of that non-anxious version of you? That is not in service of the ve the best version of you? Because right now, whether that be through therapy, coaching, counseling, hypnotherapy, so many branches on this healing tree, right? You're going to need a little bit of help through this. I'm a mental health coach. I needed help through this. Therapists have therapists. Counselors have therapists. Counselors have counselors. This isn't meant to be a lonely road. You know, I know that some movies and some stories and some, I assure you, everyone has had help in one form or the other. And if you are asking for help, joining a community, going to a coach, going to a therapist, counselor, that is not a weakness. That's not like a chink in your armor. What that is, is the badge of honor of how strong you actually are. Whenever anybody reaches out to me to talk about anxiety, to talk about needing help through certain things, the first thing I say is, wow, how proud I am. That's brave as shit. Do you know how hard it is to reach out to someone and say, I don't feel good enough? I need a little bit of help. And not only that, I've been watching videos. I've been watching your community. I've been watching the way... And I had the courage to reach out to ask for help. Do you know how hard that can be? That is a strength. Bottling it up, never talking about it, living with anxiety, agoraphobia, panic disorder, and never addressing the true problems or asking for help because you feel weak. That's not strength. I'm not going to call it stupidity because I've done it. I know people do it. It's being hard-headed. It's being scared, which is okay. But understand, there's a level of grit. There's a level of just do it that has to come out of this. If if I ask you, what is the five best ways to get through your anxiety right now? And you're not doing any of them? That's the accountability. That's what you have to look in and be like, hmm. Well, I'm a very smart person. I know how to work through this. I know how to get through this. I know who I can talk to to get through this. But I'm not. What's that Taylor Swift song? I'm the problem. It's me. Right? It's not the anxiety. It's We all have a choice to do these things. Um, and I talked to so, through some people who have gone through some really tough life experiences. And I've seen the strength, the bravery, the courage to get through all of that trauma, work through all that anxiety, through that depression, through the PTSD. I've listened. I've been able to communicate and hear. And firsthand, I see how strong people can be and how strong you have to be to work through this. Don't look at anxiety as a weakness. It is a stepping stone to your strength. Exposure therapy, going into a record store, to cause your heart rate to jump up to 150 and sit there for 10 minutes and survive. That is not weakness. That is what it takes to get through this. So when we're having tough days, like yesterday, when I was having an anxiety attack and I just, and it was all day, right? Now peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. 
But the first thing I tell myself is this isn't easy. This isn't meant to be easy. This takes strength to get through this. So if you're working through that, like first off, look in the mirror and understand like you are a brave soul. You It takes a lot of strength to be here and work through the things you are working through. You got this. You have gone through the toughest of days. What we're working on now is understanding, demystifying, stop removing the grips that anxiety has on us. And we're starting to learn that it's actually making us stronger. You have to be so strong to get through this, so strong to want to understand, so strong to reach out to people, so strong to even tune into this podcast to have the inkling that you want to better yourself that you want or that you are looking for somebody to talk to about this, looking for community to, do you know how much of a stepping stone that is where we could have been binge watching all the things that cause us anxiety, the news, talking about politics, talking about the ins and outs of different beliefs and this and that. No, you are surrounding yourself right now by listening to this and you are working your way towards the best version of yourself. The best version of you demystifies anxiety. The best version of you better understands how you can help yourself, understands that there is help out there. Sorry for my rant, but that felt like it was like almost felt like it was channeled. Like somebody here had to hear that. Somebody here that was meant for. I don't know if you're the person listening to it and you're like, that's me. I need, I needed that kick in the butt. <laughs> I needed to hear that a little bit. Um, cause it was almost like I was talking to myself, talking to two years ago, Ben and being like, Hey, you're so much stronger than you feel right now. Um, this is going to take strength. It's going to take practice. It's going to take consistency. It's going to take belief. If I can give you two things, two secret ingredients that I say blindly follow, not for scientific facts, not for anything like that. But if you are looking for positive momentum on this journey, you are on, I have two ingredients that are going to change your life. They're not easy. They're not easy, but they will change your life. One is belief. You need to believe that there is light. This Watching this podcast, understanding that I've gone through the things that you have gone through, experienced the feelings you've experienced, and I found and find ways to manage them and live a more positive life, a, a less anxiety-driven life and a purposeful life, there's a light. That's not a, hey, look at me, I'm the best. That's a, I was in curled up in a ball for days in a bedroom while my fiance was in the other rooms. And I, a six, three, 200 and something pound man felt like I was crippled. You can do this. I promise you can do this. And it starts with one belief that you can do this. The belief that there's better out there for you. All you have to do is see that sliver and believe that that sliver of light is going to get bigger, 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 and bigger. It's going to take you on a journey. You're going to learn more things about you. You're going to find the things that love, the things that bring you joy that otherwise that you would never have found. And two, consistency. Showing up. As my grandma says, as my nan says before Nike ever said it, just do it. Oh, you feel bad. You don't want to work out today. Just do it. You know of all the things that make you feel good that want to do this, but you just don't have it in you. Just do it. Show up. And this is where me and my mom have the conversation is show up for five minutes. You don't have to show up for the hour. You don't have to put in the 600 calorie workout, this and that. Show up for five minutes because I promise you in those five minutes, you're going to shift. The mindset's going to change a little bit. You're going to start feeling differently than you did for five minutes ago. If you start going for a walk, that's right. Just taking the first step makes the rest easier. The first step is the hardest. You hear about people's secret of getting into the gym? Get dressed. Put your shoes on. Let your mind know you're going somewhere. That's what you need to do. Today, that's what I did. I was like, you know what? Uh, my lower back kind of hurts today. I don't, I started looking up on my phone 
is it okay to work out with sciatica pain? And I started to call myself on my bullshit. I was like, what are you doing? Yes, your back is hurt a couple, but you can go down on the elliptical for five minutes. Put your shoes on. I put my shoes on. Kissed my fiance and said, I don't really feel like doing this, but I have to go downstairs to see if we got water in the basement. Nice. We didn't get water in the basement. I walked down and said, I just started on the elliptical. I started listening to old emo pop punk songs, something corporate, if anybody listens to them or has listened to them, and took me down memory lane. All of a sudden, I was vibing on that elliptical. And I looked down, I'm 20 minutes in. Of course, con the song constant seems 10 minutes to begin with, but I'm 20 minutes in. And I was like, well, I got, I got 30 minutes in me. And so I went from yesterday feeling like a worthless piece of garbage to today rebuilding that value rebuilding i'm helping people i had a dear friend of mine reach out in a comment and say they are working through something that they are not feeling great about themselves and i said this week we're moving together i'm going to hold you accountable you hold me accountable and we've tagged each other in posts these past two days and to see the smile that's my value so now we're looking at what is your, that's the lesson my anxiety taught me. I wouldn't have gotten that satisfaction. I wouldn't be doing this podcast on this topic, making this connection for you to hear it. If I didn't go through it and ask myself, what are you teaching me? These lessons don't come out. So understand your anxiety is teaching you something. Invite it in, sit it on the couch, pour it a drink. And then when you learn the lesson, when it tells you the lesson, say, okay, I'm going to continue on with my day now. Thank you for the talk. You're more than welcome to leave whenever you want. And when you start moving around, doing your thing, cleaning your apartment, stuff like that, anxiety wants to be like, hey, I, I also have a couple more words. Hey, uh, nope, nope. I appreciate the lesson. And then you'll walk, you, you'll walk it right on out the door, right? Because in this episode, what we talked about was what anxiety is. The body is telling one story and the mind is telling the other. The brain is reading what the body is telling it. And the mind is like, I don't pick up on that story. Imagine if you had like a big bowl and over time, you've just been putting stresses into this bowl, not even knowing it. So some things maybe your mother said, or some things that happened at work, some things that are at the house, the, the dishes are piling up, whatever putting it in. You just keep putting stuff in there, but you don't recognize it. Your body and your brain recognize it, but your mind is going the other way, going the other way. Well, the anxiety is the bowl overflowing. The panic attack is the bowl overflowing. And your mind goes, I don't know why I feel this way. Your body and your brain know damn well why. It's surviving. That amygdala we talked about, that connection of reading the body, it's to protect you from lions in the Serengeti. That is where we genetically come from. We were meant to survive <laughs> in the outdoors fighting against lions, tigers, bears. Oh my. We're now sitting at desks. We're no longer doing that right now. Not all of us. Majority of us are not doing that. So your body genetically feels that still operates with that same set of circumstances that it has. Your mind, not so much. So that's what we learned about anxiety. We kind of demystified that, right? Like, oh, well, that's just what anxiety is. There's no other secret juice. Like, that's what anxiety is. It's raised level of cortisol, which is in your blood. And the raised level of cortisols, cortisols, <laughs> cortisol is going to release adrenaline. And when your adrenaline releases... Your heart rate goes up. Your body feels like it's running a marathon and it's sitting in place. Now, when we think about that this way, it sounds uncomfortable, right? It's like, well, my body feels like it's on mile 24 of the New York City or Boston Marathon and I'm watching New Girl. That doesn't feel right. Yeah, that's very uncomfortable. That's what your body is experiencing. <laughs> So when you sit there, understand that, like, okay, I can get up, I can walk around, I can move a little bit, I can 
sit through this, understand what's happening. And then most importantly, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. I'm going to work through what I was doing tonight because I appreciate the sentiment of letting me know I feel like I'm in trouble, but I know I'm safe. I'm okay. So that's, that's, that's anxiety in, if you're an office fan, it's like explaining anxiety. Like we're five, your body feels like it's running really fast. Your mind thinks it's sitting here watching a TV show. The disconnect of that is the anxiety and the panic. And now it might feel like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But when the anxiety arises, it's a little bit tougher to believe that because anxiety likes to think it runs a show. It's the director of your Broadway play. It's not. You're still the director. It's just a really convincing actor that has you convinced that it's right. It knows bet. It doesn't. So this helps us break the stigma of anxiety and what it is and the control it has over us. And remember not to have, not to feel like you have to go at this by yourself. Um I like to use the thought of if your main goal is to feel better Seeking out support is going to get you there two to three times as fast. You're going to have someone there that holds you accountable. If you surround yourself with positive people and supportive people, they're not going to cause you the anxiety that other things might cause you. If you have a coach, a therapist, or a counselor, they're going to give you different perspective. They're going to give you different coping strategies, self-care strategies. Help. Is exactly that. It's help. Asking for help is not the weakness we talk about. Being bullheaded and stubborn isn't a badge of honor. Being the one to seek support to better your circumstance, to understand you have a goal of feeling better, um, and this is the route that is going to help me. My pride's not going to get in the way. If anything, you should be prideful that you're asking for help. That's a big one. And if you don't know where to ask for help, if you don't know how to ask for help, um, like I said, reach out to me on any of my channels. You can write me a note on my website, www.somebodylikeyou.org. Um, and I can either help you with coaching, point you in a direction that I feel might be best for the things you're working through. Um, you can always set up a 15 minute call just to chat and be like, hey, this is what I'm going through. What do you think? How can you help me? Do you know anybody else that might be able to help me? Because the beautiful thing about this healing community is I've had the opportunity to be introduced to a lot of amazing people that have helped not only me, but I've seen help friends, family. I've seen people just help people. So I have that network with me. So remember, asking for help leads to help. As common sense as that may sound, it leads to help. And remember to practice self-compassion and self-love. Don't be so hard on yourself. This, is, this isn't for the weak. This is tough. You are where you are because you've survived up to this point. Now it's time to do things a little bit differently to take that next step. You got it. You have a community of people. You have the resources. And if you're not directly reaching out for help right now, I make so much content that is going to help you around this. And that is all free. That is all Giving as I and one of my things I say is I, I give my talents freely. That is one of the affirmations I say to myself because that makes me feel good. So seek the support, filter your content, check out any of my pages if you're looking for more help on anxiety, setting boundaries, relationships, anything mental health. I'm here to help you with that. Um, and I just want to express gratitude to everyone on this journey. I want to express the gratitude to everyone who listens to interacts, who shares, who posts anything to help others. We're all out here just to make a positive ripple and we're all part of the solution. Um, even though we feel like we're kind of going through it right now, we are part of the solution because the things we're going through helps others who are also going through it. 
So I want to say thank you to everyone who's listening live, everyone who is tuning in after the live event or after the live podcast. I want to wish you all the most wonderful rest of your day. And I want to get on out of here by expressing all of my love, all of my thanks, and I will catch you on the next episode of the Somebody Like You podcast. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. I will talk to you when I talk to you. See you later.